Hey, hello, everybody. Welcome back to the Think Tech Hawaii Studios for another episode of Security Matters. Today, we're going to try a little deep dive for you with, um, I think we called it new compute for a new era. Uh, era. We have um, Sean Holiday with us today. He's a senior director of business development for, for Vision uh, at Blaze. Um, Blaze is, has built a new architecture for AI computing, and we're going to we're going to get into the, the why, then we're going to get into the what, and we'll uh, work our way through this. Sean, I really appreciate you taking time out to join me today. I know uh, Gary and your team are always working hard, so I know uh, taking some time out to share with the world is a good thing. I appreciate it. Yeah, I really appreciate the time, Andrew, and thank you for inviting me on the show. No worries. Well, let's um, let our audience get in, uh, introduced to you a little bit, um, maybe take them through your background as much as you'd care to share, and then uh, we'll get going. That sounds good. So again, my name is Sean Holiday, and I've been with Blaze a little over two years. And Blaze is a fast-growing startup. I actually even argue that we're not a startup. We're moving into full commercial production with our second-generation products. Um, I come from a long history in IoT, wearables, mobile devices. Um, majority of my career, at Intel Corporation, and um, so I'm excited to be here to talk about uh, the the market opportunity for AI uh, specifically, and and how our technology and products fit into that space. Awesome. Okay, we are going to get there. First, I, I, I noticed on your LinkedIn profile, and I got to bring this up. It was mm -hmm. like AI, um, uh, IoT, and bicycles. So t tell yep. us a little bit about that, and then we'll get into Blaze. <laughs> yeah, well, obviously, number one is AI, because that's, that's just the, the buzzword of the market. Plus, it's, it's an area that I'm, I'm deeply excited about uh, with Blaze, obviously. Um, IoT is where I've spent most of my career. Right? So at Intel, I helped build up some of the original IoT uh, strategy back in uh, you know 2010 2012 time frame and then bicycles I'm all about bicycles so I occasionally race but I also founded and run a nonprofit that provides free bicycles to uh, low-income homeless um, and uh, various different regions around the world man I love that I love that story I love it how our tech community gives gives back you know it's um mm -hmm. it's one of the hallmarks of our, of our industry that I really appreciate so thank you for that all right, so let's let's talk about AI. A lot of people, I think the word gets overused personally. Mm -hmm. um, give us give us what what your you know your your introduction into AI was, and then where where is it today um, from your perspective? I'm one of these you know it's still machine learning sort of guys, right? And mm -hmm. a lot of a lot of ML gets I think re re or characterized as AI instead of a form of AI. But anyway, mm -hmm. talk us through what what uh what it means for, you know from your perspective and uh, where it's at today. Yeah, I sure will. Uh, well, number one, I mean, obviously AI, especially if you're an invested community, technology AI is a, is a definite buzzword today, and, and rightfully so. Um, if you look at some of the analysts out there, and, and everyone has their numbers, by 2025 in our area, it's a $150 billion opportunity, business opportunity. Wow. Um, so it's, it's, uh, it's the reason we're investing where we are, why we've developed our architecture is to, uh, to be a key player in this space. Um, but if you look at the applications of AI, it's going to touch every business around our globe, whether you're farming, doing agriculture, you're, you're building gaming machines, you're using it in medical or finance. The application of machine learning and deep learning to um, reduce operational costs, increase efficiency, increase, increase customer satisfaction is all going to be driven by AI technologies and the capabilities that it offers. And and so we're talking about using data to maybe drive behavior, data to drive industrial decision making, mm -hmm. data to speed up an assembly line, data to slow it down, maybe, mm -hmm. um, you know, without without human intervention. Um, is when does when does that data truly become intelligence um, in your perspective? Well, it really depends. Um, if you look at the early days of AI and a lot of the deployments today, everything's done in the cloud. You know, Amazon, AWS, Google, Microsoft, have all done a phenomenal job in building up the infrastructure. But you sh you're shipping all of your data to the cloud, making a decision mm. and then sending it back. The major transition we're seeing in AI today is moving those decisions to the point of data acquisition. So in, in reference to IoT, at that device that is collecting data, whether it be images, video, vibration data off of an industrial machine trying to detect um, maybe a bearings going out so you can do preventative maintenance and not shut down a production line, for example. Um, that's, that's really what's driving a lot of the AI. And the big decision is today is where do you put that compute? Do you put it in the camera, around the camera, in the networking devices, in the servers, or in the cloud? And the answer is yes to all of those, really depending on what you're trying to accomplish, the time frame involved, um, and the business models involved. 
Um, do you think, or, you know, from the architectural perspective, do you think we'll be able to dynamically sort of reallocate that intelligence as it grows? And I'll give you an example of my question. Let's say I'm using just a camera to look for someone in a room of 10 people. And let's just say the mm -hmm. camera's got enough power on board to do that. But now there's a thousand people in that same room. Wow. So I've got to push that, that um, query or that, that workload to the, uh, let's say a server in the back room. And then okay. let's say it's, it's all of a sudden, you know, that was just the, the weight maintenance crew. Then it was the football field. Now it's the whole stadium, you know, 70,000 people. And I'm trying to find this thing and I've got to push that to the cloud. Is, the, is there enough intelligence in the architecture today to sort of do that dynamically and say, hey, um, I'm, I'm overloaded. I need more compute power. Let's shift this workload or something like that. Is that ha happening or is it possible or am I, am I crazy? Well, it's happening already. And as I mentioned nice. earlier, there's really four key areas, again, to put your technology either at the point of data acquisition or all the way back in the cloud. And all four of those, in, in, those key categories can be working simultaneously. Okay. Um, I'll give you a great example. So uh, we're working with customers that are deploying our technology in an industrial setting. They're tracking the movement and the position of people around machines. They're tracking the movement position of those machines and making sure that, that, uh, that um, unsafe um, uh, environments aren't created uh, by people putting their hands where they shouldn't be. At the same time, they're tracking the widgets coming off that machine, maybe the quality. These things evolve over time. Um, there may be situations where you need to uh, look at something later. So you may ship that data back to the cloud and make a decision overnight versus the things that need to happen immediately. Somebody's hand going in the way of the machine, you need to make an immediate decision. So those types of models are happening simultaneously. So wow. you can take that sa exact same architecture via applications and maybe look at load balancing. Um, maybe as you mentioned, at the, in the evening in a smart city application, this is another application that we have working with customers where our technology would be uh, deployed on a street corner, tracking automobiles, reading license plates, tracking people. Well, during rush hour, you probably need more compute power. You need to add more processing to detect all the various different objects. At three o'clock in the morning, you probably don't. You need to burn up your local uh, power. Um, but also playing into these decisions of going from the cloud or maybe this distribution is, what is your connectivity? Are you over 5G? Do you have the bandwidth? Mm -hmm. Um, do you have a, an operational model where it's very costly to uh, constantly up, upload that data? That also plays in that to the decision. So um, the answer to that is yes, but it really comes down to the business model and the timing of when decisions need to be made. Interesting. And you, you brought up bandwidth. Um, is, this, um, is it still a constraint today? I mean, I know this, it's a lot. When we say data, that's such a mm -hmm. you know, broad term, right? So when we're collecting, you know, 10,000 points a second or whatever it may be, is, the, is that a true uh, issue? Is this what, why it's maybe better to do things at the edge? Because it's just, there's not time yeah. to take all this data back, process it and send it back down for action? Well, again, it really depends on the application. And let's I say in a, uh, again, industrial setting where you get functional safety, you have to hit that magic number of making a decision under 100 milliseconds. Oh, 100 wow. milliseconds, if you look at your network topology, you're not going to send something up to the cloud, run it through a model, send it back down within that time frame. So there, it's very important to make that decision at the point of data acquisition because it's critical. It's, it's within functional safety. You can apply that same methodology, say, to mobility or autonomous vehicles, autonomous delivery machines. You need to make everything at the point. There's, there's no. You're not going to drive a car with the cloud, for example. <laughs> right? I, I don't sure. think we want to try that at, at this point in time. So. Um, so um, I guess in the, in to, to take it to the physical security world, so this device, let's just say a, re a regular, back, you know, BMS, a door switch, right? Mm -hmm. It actually senses that door open, door closed immediately and sends mm -hmm. that signal downstream. So IoT, AI compute, what we're talking about is everything happening out there that quickly. And then the decision that has been, I guess, programmed or a series of decisions or outputs mm -hmm. that are required come right out of that device themselves and, and go to the, the receiving actor or whatever it may be, the receiving Correct. device. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Yeah, so yeah, it, it, just to give you a great example, I'll, let me play upon the store example. One of the number one use cases, especially in retail and business in, in the world of COVID today, um, a lot of business have um, existing building access systems. Well, they only want people coming into the building who are conforming to mask requirements if it's required in your region. 
So they need the ability at the snap of a finger to read your credentials, but also scan you. Are you wearing a mask? Yes or no. If you're wearing a mask, the door opens. If it doesn't, it gives you an indication, put a mask on and we'll happily let you in our building. So those types of things are being combined. The AI piece would be the mask detection. Standard IoT would be, you know, open the door, close the door type of decision. Gotcha. So a little bit of combination with the old world and the new world. Um, you know, I've seen um, Tanmay Bakshi speak. I'm sure you, you know of him, the, the, the mm -hmm. wizard kid. He was really doing a lot of healthcare driven stuff. And he's given some classes on how easy it is to stand up and code for, for AI. And mm -hmm. um, how, let me ask you a question. How, how far along are we? Are we one percent of the way are we are we just have we scratched the surface yet do we really know what we're capable of with with uh, um, uh artificial intelligence I, I think we're just scratching the surface i mean ai technology wow. has been around for decades but the yeah. application and we're just now getting to a point um via next generation technology tool sets being available to make it more pervasive and, and easy for people to program for example at blaze uh, we have standard SDK development tools so you can program in C, C++, use TensorFlow, PyTorch, Cafe, AI uh, type of um, models. But the, there's a whole other segment of the market that's going to explode. And these are business owners who maybe don't have data scientists on board, but they need to use AI. And we've developed software called AI Studio that allows you to pretty much uh, click and drag via GUI interface and create a complete AI application without writing a single line of code. So wow. the, you know, a big part of this industry is how do we take the complex that takes data, or excuse me, data scientists and transition to such a way that the, the, the average guy like myself, I, you know, I can write hello world. That's about the extent of my programming <laughs> experience, um, but be able to develop an AI application and put it into a real world uh, scenario. Wow. Um, and I, is the thinking that the people who do the job are the ones that understand what they need it to do? Is that why we want to give that sort of power? Is that open source, by the way? Is that is the tooling available, or is it something that you sell? Is it a, a well? It, yeah, it's something that's part of our overall software environment that we offer okay. with our hardware products. We, our, our business model is selling devices. We've developed a, okay. a core architecture that has gone into silicon. That silicon goes on to various different types of board products that plug into servers or they're standalone, like for embedded IoT applications. This software enables you to um, you know, build those type of models in what we call a codeless environment for our products. Wow. Yeah, I've seen, and there's a lot of code sort of out there. And there's, mm -hmm. I, it's amazing to me the variety of, of types of code that I see listed that can be written for AI. Is that specific to the type of data people are gathering or are they gathering from some environment where using a, a certain type of code just makes it easier to interact with like a legacy system that has the data that they're trying to grab or to you know give it to well it's it, it at the application level you may have to build um your applications to conform to specific interfaces depending on the environment that you're in and that will tell you specifically what tools that you use but from the ai development model it's it's pretty typical you're in tensorflow five torch or cafe in terms of um you know traditional um, ai models but then you may go into an open VX or an open CL or a C or C++ environment. Um, a lot of applications are being written in Python today, for example. Um, these are all capabilities that our software supports. So it gives you a lot of flexibility in going forward. The other big part of AI is that um, the types of models you use, uh, detection models, classification models, recognition models are all different. Some of those may be optimized in a specific um, language or, or environment, um, it, which would say, hey, you know, I'm going to use this model because it's been, uh, there's a lot of uh, work I can gather from GitHub and others for TensorFlow based models or for PyTorch or, or PyTorch or CAFE models, for example. I gotcha. I see. Okay. Yep. Interesting. That's so good. That's, so that's for all my parents out there. Get your kids studying these languages because it's going to be mm -hmm. what they need to know. Uh, Sean, we'll be right back. We're going to take a okay. break. We'll pay some bills. Uh, and we'll be back in about one minute with Sean Holiday. Stick okay. around.
Hey, aloha. Welcome back to Security Matters. We're with Sean Holiday today of Blaze, and we are getting ready to dive a little bit deeper. We've been talking about AI, talking about the why of AI, talking about the what of AI. Um, Sean, you were just mentioning a little bit about the, the, these different types of workflows that are that are that sort of are perhaps found if you want to do if you want to build an application, maybe with facial recognition. There's a lot of data available, and it's in a certain type of of uh, a programming language already, mm -hmm. so that makes your adoption easier um, or easier to get to. Um, is the let's let's go down in the, in under the hood just a little bit now with these these um a the AI specifically Blaze, and I think uh, others probably. Um, have been trying to leverage um, hardware, you know, along with the software to deliver these capabilities that we all see we are now capable of building. Um, talk to us a little bit about the what was lacking maybe when the founders of Blaze, I think maybe it was a 10 years ago or so, what was lacking then that they saw, you know, about where we'd be today with, a, with something like what Blaze has to offer? Okay, yeah, great question. And, and this is really goes to the heart of why we're doing what we're doing in, in our architecture. Um, and so if you look back and, you know, all of us, you know, around uh, kind of around our age, so to say, if we went through university and technology, we were, we were brought up on x86, we eventually learned, uh, you know, GPU architectures and so forth. And, you know, these are phenomenal general purpose architectures. Um, obviously, they, they fuel the PC revolution server, the build out of the internet and everything else. Um, they're great for multi-purpose running fairly generic type of workloads. But when you get into machine learning and deep learning, you get into running very specific types of math um, that isn't necessarily tailored to run on a general purpose CPU or GPU efficiently. They definitely can. I mean, obviously NVIDIA has done a, an amazing job building out and, and applying their products towards uh, AI, but the efficiency isn't there. There's a, there's a power penalty that you're gonna pay. Uh, mm. There's a price penalty you're gonna pay. And really what, what drove our architecture is in looking at uh, various different ways we could apply it especially in the automotive area. If you look at uh, companies that are invested in this, like Daimler, for example, their biggest challenge going forward in the next generation autonomous and EV vehicles is how do I maintain my performance that I need for AI for detecting what's going on in the road, uh, doing drive pathing planning, but not have 3000 watts of compute in the trunk of my car. Mm. So it's all about compute efficiency. So how many, what is my performance per watt per dollar? And that's okay. where our architecture comes in, where we're seeing anywhere from 10x up to 60x uh, performance enhancement over some of these more traditional architectures, like a, an Intel x86 or an NVIDIA GPU architecture. Yeah, that and that that energy expenditure, that heat low. We in Hawaii, we pay like 43 cents a kilowatt hour. So like mm -hmm. data center work here, adding a server to a space that's going to cause heat, mm -hmm. and then you've got to pay to cool it. There's a lot of cost there. Is that a, an issue with AI compute in data centers as well? Do they that they, they want to bring that cost down for power and, and cooling? Well, definitely. And, and, and even you look at the big players like a, you know an, an AWS or a Google or a Microsoft, you know they're paying you know tens of million dollar, dollars uh, you know a day or a week in, in just electricity costs. Wow. So constantly looking at next generation technologies that will lower the power um, is going to save their bottom line and. So whether it's a, a, a very low cost, uh, low performance IoT device sitting out on the edge, or it's high performance servers sitting in the cloud, power is always a concern. Um, and looking at these next generation architectures that could do the same workload or more at, at, at a much lower power budget is a, a key driver in some of our, lot. well, I would say that many of our discussions with customers today. That's awesome. Or is it, is it be, simply because the, the particular, um, workload is, is specific versus like my only reference would be like my windows computer can do all kinds of different things mm -hmm. but of course there's a higher cost and it's slower whatever it may be if mm -hmm. it only did one thing for example a certain type of workload um mm -hmm. it could probably be cheaper and run faster is that Correct. is that kind of the idea well it's kind of the idea but you know our architecture what we call graph streaming processing architecture is still 100 percent programmable but it's done in such a way that, that the way we've implemented our internal pipelining of data, utilization of memory, utilization of, of the math or the, 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 the math units has made it much more efficient to run the, that same workload that may run on an x86 or an NVIDIA GPU, for example. Um, so it, again, that's how we focus. So 
Um, and this gets into another uh, area in the market is fixed function devices that maybe do two to three, two to three things really well. Mm. But if, if you need to re, you know, do that fourth thing, it falls flat on performance or power, for example. Um, and, and so if you look at what we pulled together, we focused on how can we provide the best performance while maintaining the most flexibility all in a, a product. And that's we bring those two worlds together um, that, that give our, you know, our customers the ability to support many different types of networks, as well as giving them flexibility to upgrade and make changes in, you know, in the future. Man, it sounds like you're just right at the very heart of what this next evolution is going to be. Um, mm -hmm. and, and being the hardware layer, you, you are. Um, yep. Is the, what, 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 where's the, where are you seeing the, the, the earliest adoption or, or I'll say the, the, the best acceleration or, or, or both, you know, whatever, where, yeah. where you guys feeling like, you know, where, who's calling you up and beating you up every day. I need those chips now. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, it's a good problem to have. And I'd like to say we, we have yeah. that problem because there are so many applications. And as I mentioned earlier, when we first started out, AI is going to touch every type of business around the globe. And we're seeing big uptakes. Industrial is really moving forward. And let me go back and preface this is that, vision processing if we look at what the analysts say if we look at it around 2025 about 70 to 75 percent of the total compute in the network is going to be on vision processing whether that's fixed images or real-time video streams because you're trying to detect things you're trying to recognize you're trying to classify so you can make a decision so the transition to doing more visual based um, compute is going to be immense. And that's really where, where AI steps in today. So where are we seeing the applications? Um, I already mentioned industrial. Uh, mobility is another area. Um, automotive is all over AI technology in terms of moving to next generation ADOS or advanced driving assistant. Um, you know, the, the likes of Tesla, for example, in terms of autonomous driving or almost full autonomous driving is a big application we're seeing. Um, retail. So the next generation of retail centers, again, especially in, in the, the world of, of COVID-19 and you know, the, the pandemic is how do you utilize the technology to ensure a safe shopping environment? Um, do people have masks on? Are our customers um, uh, doing social distancing? Are there situations that are healthy, happening within our retail center that we could change due to what AI is detecting, shoplifting or placement of products, all those type of things. Um, smart city is another big area. Um, again, uh, as we, we see municipalities that are trying to do more with less, utilizing the cameras they have around their city streets to make intersections safer, to turn on and off uh, very easily toll tracking, maybe at different times of the day, just mm -hmm. because you're, you're built, you can do license plate recognition on multiple uh, or hundreds of cars simultaneously using AI technology. Th these are just some of the areas that we're seeing uh, in application. Agriculture is another area. Imagine the big John Deere tractor going down the field and it has multiple cameras and it looks at each individual plant and based off of the model it's trained on, it'll say, does this plant need fertilizer A, B, C, or D or insecticide Ooh. one, two, three, or four? Wow. And it only applies what that particular plant needs all based off of AI technology. So re really cool usage models uh, for sure. That's amazing. I love the agricultural yield question mm -hmm. too. That's a thing the whole world's facing. I yep. saw one yesterday, uh, a young man had coded it up. He was running it on his phone, but he, he could tell if a guy was getting ready to steal, steal a base in baseball. Mm -hmm. And he, he said it was pretty accurate. So I thought that was pretty interesting application. Yeah. Uh, maybe, for, maybe for the gamblers in Vegas, you never know. <laughs> well, I, I think that, yeah, the gaming industry is probably, they, they embrace AI because it can help them. But at the same time, AI in the hands of maybe the, the person on the other side of that machine, maybe uh, it gives them uh, <laughs> some sort of advantage, right? <laughs> it's so interesting. Um, in insecurity, uh, particularly in my you know my industry mm -hmm. in this applied industry, um, what what part do we have to play? You know, we're we're like deployment guys. We're fairly applied, right? The the technology is built for us. We just go out, we install it, we configure it. What um. What's the role for our industry, do you see? Um, are, are we going to just be the delivery guys for the technology, or do we have a greater role to play? Well, I think it's, um, and again, I'm coming from a background of many years in IoT, and security was always a big aspect of it, especially when you have all these devices hanging off of networks all over the place. How do you secure that device, right? How do you know that somebody hasn't broken into that device and is utilizing it in an mm. in in improper way? Um, 
So the security industry is going to play a huge part in continuing doing that, securing the AI devices so people can't modify the models. So, so imagine um, mm. that in, in AI, uh, a big portion when you train a model, you create what we call weights. And those weights help you determine, is this a dog? Is it a cat? Is it a bird? You know, just using a simple example, um, what if somebody hacked into a system and made a very slight modification that changed that decision? That, that, that could wreak havoc on an AI network, for example, especially yeah. in a safety scenario. So uh, the good work that the security field is doing, um, you know, blacklisting, whitelisting technologies, um, you know, encryption technologies uh, that protect the applications, the AI um, applications running on hardware is going to remain the same. But as, as it uh, proliferates throughout uh, around the globe, it's even going to become more important to become an integral part of this. And I think as we've seen security become part of like, you know, when media went digital, security ah, yeah. integrated into the media via conditional access and other technologies, right? We're going to see the same requirement for AI is how do you secure that model, right? How do you, how do you know that image you're looking at is the image that's coming from the device that you should be monitoring and not something inserted by a hacker to fool the device? Those type of things are, will be very, very important. Yeah, I absolutely love that. I've, I've definitely done some reading on, you know, uh, kind of messing with the input to AI or to mm -hmm. ML models, right? And when you can corrupt that input, you can create, you know, obviously strange yeah. outcomes. Well, yeah. we're under a minute or so left. Um, okay. Sort of closing thoughts, a challenge for the industry or whatever you'd like to share. Well, I think, you know, um, AI, if you're not involved in AI today, look at how it's going to impact your business. If you're, you're a, a business owner watching this podcast, start talking with your colleagues, start talking with consultants, learn how AI can benefit you um, from your OPEX and your CAPEX uh, standpoint. Um, if you're a developer, if you're in the software space, you, you have to get involved in AI today. Learn the coding, learn the diff various different frameworks, learn how it be, can be integrated in your technology. And of course, if, if you're looking for an AI solution, we highly recommend you take a look at Blaze. Um, you know, our architecture is, is, is novel, it's new. Um, it's a different way of doing things and it um, really shows uh, a very strong promise in meeting those new performance and price point uh, metrics that we're starting to see. That is awesome. Sean, thank you so much for joining us today. Okay. Super informative episode. Uh, check out Blaze if you're in the AI game, people. Take care, everybody out there. Aloha. All right.